in the last section of Fukuyama's book, The Last Man and the End of History, he goes over The Last Man and he goes over some of the possible limitations to liberalism. And this is probably Fukuyama's uh, best work he's ever, that I've ever encountered from him. Um, and it's the thing about him which makes him still relevant today. Although he himself has not taken this section of his work and followed it through honestly. He's sort of rejected, he's kind of forgotten about it. And he's um, not observing and discussing the evident um, symptoms of the potential failures which he predicted uh, a long time ago. So what does Fukuyama say in this um, last section? Well, I've written about this, so I'll put the link in the description to the little, little kind of bit of research and, and writing that I've done on this. But um, in general, he discusses it from the point of view of Thymos, which is the spirited side of the soul, deals with recognition, anger, indignation, and also deals with a sense of status, um, social status. And um, Fukuyama basically, using very Nietzschean frameworks, says this, the left wing opposition to liberalism has failed, um, communism, and that even though there isn't presently a right wing um, opposition to liberalism, using a sort of Nietzschean framework, you could see one emerging in the future. And this is absolutely what's happened to some extent, at least. Um, now we can argue about the def the, we can argue about the usefulness of the definition of right and left. I think these definitions are increasingly not useful, but um, uh, but he basically predicted that um, certain elements of liberalism's capacity to deal with megalothymia, which is an excessive thymotic impulse, um, that there may be limitations within liberalism to actually deal with that in some sort of acceptable manner. But so just so for, for people who don't know, um, isothymia is the desire to be recognized as equal and megalothymia is the more excessive to be desired as superior, higher. So Napoleon, right, is a good example of megalothymia. Whereas an ordinary person is uh, a good example of isothymia. At least an ordinary person within modern democratic liberal societies. So the question becomes, can a society function without Napoleons or their historical equivalents? Um, and what do we do with those people? Where do we place them and so forth? That becomes the question. Now, Trump is an interesting figure to bring into this because I do not in any way want to compare Trump to Napoleon. But <laughs> Trump was certainly someone who at least in character expresses in its, in his own perverted late capitalist manner expressed a sort of megalothymotic tendency. And if he was the only one with that today, like he was some sort of like, you know, a strange, uh, strange atavistic phenomena, which hadn't been evolved out of or something. And he was, the, and you know, this wouldn't be a problem. He wouldn't be popular basically, but, but his popularity. And I think why his popularity was, there was a high sensitivity to his popularity among liberals was because his popularity expressed that something within and now people don't use these frameworks for thinking other than me Fukuyama Peter Sloterdijk 
a few, uh, you know, like a, a, some other prop people. I like there's only probably like less than twenty people in the entire world that even that even use the word thymos on a regular basis. But uh, unconsciously, at least, I think this the popularity of Trump was a um, sign that the thymotic economy. We, we, we always talk about the libidinal economy. You know, what about the thymotic economy? That the thymotic economy was um uh, in contemporary liberal life was a was a disaster and this the it, and it was it was a sign of total failure and how do you respond to that sign of total failure do you respond to it honestly or do you double down uh, and accuse everyone of being a fascist and um so forth well this is what most liberals have done including including to some extent fukuyama maybe in a more sophisticated way He's also taken seriously the uh, failures in, in this regard, but uh, well, he wrote about them a long time ago. I mean, I mean, in recent years, he's not, um, as I said, as I said earlier, following through these observations honestly. But most contemporary thinkers, uh, public intellectuals, even the even the very intelligent ones who predicted these problems, have basically not been willing to follow through. So why is there increasingly a need to follow through with this um, crisis in the thymotic economy? Well, and I'm going to bring Nietzsche back into it in a minute because this is why we need to reread Nietzsche in a certain regard. Um, the general question which is posited in this regard with liberalism is, are we willing to give up excessive historical significance and exceptionality and turn our backs on the, the, ex, the excessively exceptional, the Napoleons and the Alexander the Greats? Um, are, we, are we willing to turn on them in order to maintain somewhat more of a, of a kind of moderate um, uh, sense of social existence? And being an, an identity, which is more stable. Um, so it's do we do we so we have similar to you know the old uh, contest between freedom and security. We have a similar contest between um, sort of sort of stability and exceptionality. Exceptionality can lead to instability. At least this was the idea. But I think what our world is showing us now is that actually inexceptionality is equally um, capable of leading to instability. Take the lockdowns as an example. Very unstable. Take the terrible, incompetent um, geopolitical decisions regarding energy economics. These are, these are leading to disasters and, and instabilities, and they're not and they're not the, they're not instabilities which are motivated by someone who wants to conquer and unify Europe. They're done by these highly mediocre uh, kind of bureaucratic administrative political figures who don't know how to actually govern anymore. So we're seeing a instability caused from below rather than from above. And I think that liberal theorists are blind to that, that they always think that, that the instability can be caused by something which is excessive in, in its, in its um, revolutionary form, maybe, or in its kind of imperialistic form, or in its um, uh, ideological form or something. But actually, no, like uh, deep instability and, and disaster can come from can come from this kind of m more moderate place. Now, in a less practical sense, and in a more psychological sense, this gets even this gets even stranger because um, the the idea was that if we are able to sacrifice exceptionality for moderation we may lose historical significance we may lose some sort of uh glory excessive glory we may lose uh excessive beauty we may lose um 
excessive character formation, but we can still have moderate moderate ones within a more stable world. But similar to what I just said, the loss of the exceptional has not been as predictable as we originally thought it was going to be, as these, as these liberals thought, thought it was going to be. The loss of the exceptional has led to a sort of derangement, actually, has led to a very strange sort of thymotic economy, which isn't as stable and equal and uh, um, enjoyable as the, let's say, the kind of isothymia supporting group, the the moderate thymotics. We can call them the moderate thymotics as if they're like a political party or something. Like they're not a political party, but they're sort of an ideological group, the moderate thymotics, which emerged from bourgeois liberal dem democratic society. Within the thymotic economy, we have the management of our identities as well. This is part of the thymotic economy. This is why Fukuyama wrote a book called Identity, um, which is which is a decent book. I'd recommend reading it. He, I, I should do a review on it actually sometime. Um, uh, it's 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 okay. He makes some errors, which maybe I'll discuss in a different video. But anyway, the point being, a thymotic economy deals with how we manage our identities. Why? Because thymos Lee is, 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 uh, correlates with recognition and recognition correlates with self-awareness, self-consciousness of understanding what we are and understanding our place in society and understanding our, our, our position on hierarchies and understanding how we, understanding how we should be or expect to be treated by others and how we should treat others and so forth. These are all within the, the, the category of recognition. So we can actually define psychopolitically the end of history now we, we're at the point where we can define it the end of history is the time of the complete power of the moderate thymotics it's the sacrifice of the exceptional and the politics and the sociality and the domesticity and the the uh, ideology of complete control of the moderate thymotics as in the complete control of the isothymia category and the complete loss of the megalothymia category. Okay, so now we need to think about Nietzsche and what was Nietzsche's problem, basically, with the world, with, with how things were going, the trajectory things were going in. And I think his problem, and Fukuyama would agree with me, because he's basically written this, <laughs> is that Nietzsche's problem is that we're going more and more and more towards a totally moderate thymos. And we still don't know. We are in a historical experiment. Never before in history has such a moderate thymos been, been pushed on us. Um, uh, this is what the end of history is. This is what the success of global capitalism and liberalism is, is this the complete success of this moderate thymos. So we're in this experiment. And Nietzsche is helpful because he predicted some of the problems that would come about through this experiment, of which he understood himself in his own time to be somewhat in, but we are 10 times in more now than he was. And um, you have these categories of, I know, like resentment and so forth and slave morality, but I think it's probably more helpful in our time to speak of these things as well, but but in regards of self-deception, because this is also what Nietzsche talks about a lot, self-deception. And the capacity for humans to self-deceive is remarkable. And um, uh, how we regulate that is important. And within this economy, this, 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 this thymotic economy of, of total moderation, which Nietzsche would say is just a code word for cowardice, basically. It's a sort of transvaluation. Uh, moderation means means mediocrity, right? Um, but how, however we want to label it, polemically or neutrally or otherwise, this thymotic economy of, uh, of, of, of uh, moderation, let's say, um, or mediocrity, if we're using the polemic term, is... It has revealed a lot of problems which we're just encountering probably for the first time in human history. 
and these problems are regarding the regulation and management of our identities. So there's an interesting question within the kind of culture wars of why, so the, okay, you have, using the trans example, you have lots of situations like, like what Jordan Peterson was caught into. Um, there's, a, there's a teacher in Ireland here who was caught into something similar. A student wants to be referred to in, in, in a pronoun. The teacher resists this. And the question really isn't here, isn't, isn't why is the kid confused? It's understandable why the kid is confused today because the destruction of gender roles and so forth is, is, is very, um, um, uh, it has been very, you know, difficult for people and, and it's, it's led to confusions. The problem is why does the larger authority, whether that be the state, whether that be the administrative systems in the universities, whether that be the media, why do these larger networks of power care so much about the fact that, or care so much about the teacher referring to this kid in this, in his way? Why do they want their, to, why do they want the kid to be symbolically managed? Why do they care so much about, uh, about this kid? We can't assume that they care about the kid. We can assume that they care about the mechanisms of symbolic management. In order to sustain ourselves on a psychological level, on a psychopolitical level, in the end of history, in the time of total mediocre, moderate, however you want to put it, thymos, the economy of, of, of a, a mediocre thymos, we seem to have to integrate and adopt these very deranged and very totalitarian sometimes mechanisms of basically identity management and symbolic management and enforce those upon people within certain spheres and certain social um, roles and so forth. Now, why? Why is there an impulse to do this? This is a question that was never answered. Because within the culture war, we get really obsessed with the kid. We go, oh my God, why is the kid so weird? Or we get so obsessed with the teacher. Why is the teacher... Like, the, people on the right will get obsessed with the kid and say, look at these crazy children. And people on the left will get obsessed with the teacher and say, why are you being so lacking compassion? And why won't you just do this to help this traumatized victim identity or whatever? But actually, the question is, like, why are the larger authorities intervening here at all why can't this just be settled between the the teacher and the and the kid or but maybe maybe the kid's parents or something maybe at the most <laughs> can get involved you know like why does the larger network of power zone in on this from the media to the state to the courts um to, to the larger administrative bureaucracy within the school or the university i can't imagine they would intervene as much if if there was a a, a a disagreement between the teacher and the kid over over i don't know like um something else which didn't involve just the, the symbolic management of identities and the reason is is that basically like when you go into the the, the hyper mediocre thymotic economy there is a insane demand for symbolic management which has never existed before on the on, on this level these are mechanisms which are not just there for the kid. They're there for the larger society in order to, to, to psychopolitically manage the larger society. Obviously, also manage it for power. And there's a class element to this too, right? But to, to, to manage that within the larger society, you need these mechanisms. And if someone, if someone resists and undermines these mechanisms, they have to be labeled a criminal, basically. Okay, so to return again briefly to Nietzsche, Nietzsche has this fantastic passage, and I did a video on it last time, and I've written about it in Substack, um, called Of the Virtue That Makes Small. And he basically talks about a kind of uh, houses which are designed for dolls, and people start to live in them. And basically what I interpret this to mean is like a kind of, uh, a, a sort of, uh, uh, domestic space civ or like a civil space which is which is designed to distort 
or designed to facilitate distortion. Um, we are, uh, in simple terms, we can be big fish in a small pond. And the small pond or the dollhouse will make us seem a lot bigger and more significant, more significant than we are. So within these symbolic, within these forms of symbolic management, you see something which is a lot older than just the kind of postmodern identity um, uh, debates around gender, but something which goes back a lot further, which is a kind of self a self deception regarding significance. This we can sort of we can sort of um, inflate our sense of significance by symbolically by managing our house, the size of our house, and that house is obviously not just a physical house, but it's also a symbolic house of um, to use this kind of Heideggerian um, you know house of being kind of uh, uh, framework, a house of um, self awareness, a house of um, uh, s symbolic management of which of course our media technologies are the absolute product of like social media is just one giant house of, of, of symbolic management and managing our identity and managing our self-awareness but w the suffocating small dollhouse which makes us feel bigger and more significant than we are which is what human beings at the end of history especially human beings who have a kind of class social status which is very 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 distinct from their sort of personal character you know you have this kind of pmc classes who are are, are always the highest uh, consumers of these symbolic commodities because their actual personal character is very, very distinct from their sort of their their sense of social status, right? There's a when a when a large distinction forms between someone's actual being and their kind of conventional self awareness through social status. This probably causes like psychological problems to some extent, or at least it causes a very like fragile sense of self awareness because it's never really secure and one of the one of the um points going back to hegel's idea of this master slave battle is that it, like if you really want your full self awareness as a master to match what you are as a being you have to fight to the death you have to you have to, you have to, you have to give yourself completely to that and fight to the death you have to completely be what it is that you're sort of identifying with in a sense right um or, or, or you completely be your actual physical being has to go through. Um, I think what he called something like full perturbation or like complete perturbation, like complete terror, basically. You have to go completely through and out the other side in order to be the master. You can't just say you're the master. And what you have with this end of history economy of, 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 of a mediocre thymos is basically... A, a a a a a sort of um, system in which no longer demands your actual being and your social status being uh, match in any way, shape, or form. That we can just declare what we are and demand that others pay symbolic reparations to what we are and pretend and perform that we are something without any sort of like standard uh, method of standardizing what we are. And it's here where we see Nietzsche's warnings start to resonate and actually come true because Nietzsche was basically always arguing something along the lines of when you remove the, 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 the megalothymia, when you remove the exceptional, when you remove those who are willing to, to, to fight to the death, for what they are, for the symbolic for the symbolic position, when you remove the excessive and the the you know admittedly you know unpredictable and just can be destabilizing in, in 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 many regards. When you remove that excess and that that kind of radical thymotic existence, you don't just have this neutral mediocrity, which is safer and 
uh, less interesting and less beautiful and less glorious, but it's still sort of it's still sort of sta it's still stable and functions. You actually remove the very standardization of which by which we understand ourselves in some sort of like sane, reasonable way. When you remove the excess, when you remove the exceptionality, when you remove the 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 embodied exemplars of the highest you remove the very mechanisms by which we understand ourselves in which this self-understanding can be minimally standardized by what we actually are or or the truth you you go into a like the the economy of the mediocre thymos actually leads to this like third category you have the highest the megalothymia you have the, the middle isothymia and you have like i don't know what you what we can call it we can come up with a new word for it this 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 bottom um stage of of thymus which doesn't say i want to be treated as equal or i want uh, or i want to be treated as higher but i want to be treated as whatever the hell i say i want to be treated with absolutely no re, re reason to believe that or standard or devotion or conviction towards that at all like it's complete complete break from reality completely and it's ironic that Nietzsche was someone who was known for rejecting truth because actually his 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 psychopolitics his psychology is actually is actually something which is radically against self-deception it's radically for um a certain form of self-honesty if Fukuyama was to take the last uh, chapter of his book, The End of History and the Last Man, and follow that, follow those Nietzschean intuitions about the limitations of liberalism seriously, he would come to the understanding that um, that the question of megalothymia isn't just a question, isn't simply a question of of um, of, of uh, excessive glory, excessive historical significance. This excessive glory and this excessive historical significance is itself a question of the truth. Insofar that that it regulates the um, house of being, which is now the house of cope. 